Hello friends, hope you had a great week. I got you there. You thought I was going to say, hope you are well. Well, I do hope you are well, so welcome to the Dirt Report tech and telco and gadget news focusing on Aussie related stuff with some international tidbits. Last week was a full week of wild NBN news. So this week, we get to focus on some other topics. So let's see what's coming up in today's episode. We have Aussie 5G speed controversy, Optus and Ericsson in bed, and Google fights Aussie pirates. I guess Google has it out for Australia at the moment. On the international tidbits, we have Facebook could lose 50% of its revenue, Bezos making more money, of course, PlayStation 5 features, and LG making masks. Oh, hello there. First time here or not? Well, if you want to see more content like this, then make sure to like and subscribe below. Roll the intro. All right, let's get started with our first topic. Australia is heading down the path of 5G, no matter how many conspiracy theorists post on Facebook and Twitter. But that doesn't mean there are no controversies surrounding it. This week, a benchmark report came out from an analyst company called OpenSignal, who measure and test worldwide mobile technology. Obviously, 5G falls into that bucket. So here is the exciting news. Australia is not last in 5G speeds. With the rollout so far across Optus and Telstra, 5G speeds have been on the rise and are even better than many other countries. We are in fact in the top 10 on the lower side at seventh place, but top 10 nonetheless, which isn't bad at all when you're competing with much smaller countries like Switzerland and Taiwan. But I would like to add Canada is number two on the list, which makes us look a little bit bad. Uh, they certainly have a lot more hills to get that 5G signal around. Nonetheless, we are doing really, really well. Now, until the NBN, I used to think, damn, my 4G is fast. Back in the day, I even uploaded a few YouTube videos with my mobile phone because I was an ADSL too. But the difference between 4G and 5G is impressive to say the least. But here is where we start to see some limitations. 4G connection availability and time spent connected is above 90%. However, 5G availability and time connected is well below 10%. Now I am sure over time this will certainly grow, but for now this is a problem for nationwide adoption. But hey, at least we're better than the UK. So now what's so controversial about this? On paper, this is great news. And don't get me wrong, it is. And the more these numbers go up, the more the NBN will end up upgrading all of us to fiber. It's actually a win-win. Now let's leave the worldwide report and zoom into Australia and its own 5G. OpenSignal released a report specifically about Optus and Telstra testing download speeds and availability for both telcos. Now in the report, Telstra wins many of the battles, as, as you can see. From overall user speeds to peak speeds, though Optus had a slight win in overall availability, the report gave them the draw, which I still think they should just given it to Optus to make it a little bit more fair. In any case, as I was reading this report, I came up on an article from Channel News, and I have linked that below for you to have a bit of a more in-depth read. They state that OpenSignal's testing mythology was a bit skewed, mainly in the speed department. Let's say you are connected to a 5G tower, your experience could vary by a lot of factors, even just distance from the tower, such as even suburbs or even weather at the time of testings, if there's any buildings in the way, tower congestion, which does not exist at the moment because there's not that many connections to 5G, mobile device capabilities, and so they did their own testing and did not get the same results as this report from OpenSignal. This again could be a significant variable based on all the above. So we don't know the testing capabilities of OpenSignal, but what caught my eye was the reference to how many devices were used to test. OpenSignal claimed they saw results from 150 5G smartphone models that were from 18 manufacturers. But looking at Telstra's website, they only offer a few 5G capable devices from Samsung, LG, Oppo, Motorola, Xiaomi, Vivo, and Huawei, a bit far from 18 headset makers, and each of them only had one. That is some spicy testing. In any case, once there are more 5G mobile devices and towers, we will get more tests and see how it all measures up. And hopefully we will also have more than Telstra and Optus to choose from. Let me know your thoughts below. Now this goes really well into our next topic and Optus is certainly fighting back because 5G is the invisible war zone we have been touting a horn about for so long. Internet speed dominance, who will be king? Optus this week announced their first test of non-standalone 5G in partnership with Ericsson. The demonstration was done on a Samsung Galaxy S20 5G phone. And you may be wondering, 
what the hell is this? What is this non-standalone 5G? Well, let's refer to Ericsson for the explanation. Ericsson is selling an approach to 5G rollout, which they say is the quickest way to dominate the space, and they are calling it non-standalone 5G. This is separate from the standalone 5G tower solutions we've all learned to love. The standalone 5G solution is your standard tower that only does 5G. Looks exactly like a 4G tower, but it requires many more to cover the same area. So, as a carrier looks to expand their 5G network, they're looking for ways to do it quickly and efficiently without having to build all new 5G towers due to cost and time. So, here comes Ericsson's non-standalone solution. This is a bolt-on to already existing 4G towers, with apparently some minor modifications to the software, the towers will be able to utilize a 5G-like frequency without having to rebuild the whole tower, meaning the rollout can scale efficiently with each new upgraded tower. Now, Ericsson says that this system will allow carriers to be the first to launch 5G and gain technology and market leadership by using this new 5G spectrum to boost capacity and increase delivery efficiency. What are the benefits of a non-standalone, you may ask? Well, it will maximize the use of the installed LTE 4G base into 5G-like performance. It provides 5G evolved packet cores for 5G devices, which means providing early adopters with 5G enabled connections and devices, which basically means, hey, you're gonna see a little 5G on your mobile phone, which probably sells it to a lot of people. I mean, marketing, right? Five is better than four. Now, it also enables video streaming, AR and VR with an immersive media experience, meaning the speeds that you're gonna be getting will allow you to do a lot of cool things on your mobile devices. Optus Managing Director of Networks, Lambo Kanaharitam, had this to say, 5G carrier aggregation is a significant technology milestone that provides us with the ability to combine two spectrum frequencies to improve and extend the coverage, speed and capacity of our 5G network. To summarize, this non-standalone option is very popular for mobile carriers looking to quickly deploy 5G speeds utilizing existing LTE 4G deployments. However, this option does not allow for true 5G features such as network slicing, URLLC, and high capacity support for IoT such as MMTC. Basically, it's a cut down, fake looking 5G version, but you do get the benefits of the speed. It's kind of like a half measure to beat others to the market. Now, I hope it was as interesting for you as it was for me learning about it. Let me know your thoughts below. Let's move on. A few years ago, Aussies were laughing at Australia being called the hotbed for piracy. In fact, Australians were downloading Game of Thrones more times than any other country during its peak. Now, take a pat on the back for that one. Screw paying $50 to Foxtel per month for that show, especially the way it ended. In any case, copyright holders have fought with ISPs, or back then, now it's RSPs, over getting details for people who pirate content. Usually it's shitty movies that didn't make any money in the cinemas and they try and make their money back by going after pirates. In any case, back in 2015, our government blocked thousands of websites that enabled you to download copyright content. Unfortunately for the government, many of us went to school and learned how to get around that very easily. Just like in Star Wars Phantom Menace, turns out that even a child could bypass the blockade. The Australian government forced RSPs to add piracy sites to their DNS and block access to them. But with a simple change of your modem's DNS to Google's, which I remember off by heart, 8888-8844. I have to change that a lot on people's modems. You can circumvent the block without breaking a sweat. Then in 2018, Google took another step and removed many sites from their Australian search results. Well, the rope is certainly tightening even further. An announcement this week said Google will de-index all proxy and mirror sites, meaning if you had some alternative links to your favorite piracy sites, you won't be able to access those either. Now, I have one major problem with this. Isn't it amazing that big copyright holders managed to put a squeeze on Google and censor its search results specifically for Australia? I know China does it, but hey, I thought this was a free country. What the hell's going on? For some reason, I feel like the war on piracy seems to be like the war on drugs. Somehow, folks that are high as a kite seem to be winning because every time this happens, they find a way around it. I really don't expect this to make any dent in Australian piracy. 
So let me know your thoughts below. Also, remember to like this video and subscribe if you'd like to see more. All right, let's move on to our international news. It's starting to show how much privacy can hurt the social media landscape. If your apps couldn't spy on you, then companies out there wouldn't be able to sell their products to you. And bam, the whole internet falls apart. Get ready to pay a Facebook subscription service. But before we get to that boring dystopia, let's talk about iOS 14's new privacy feature. Now in the past, I mentioned how the new iOS has the ability to let users know what aspects of their phone each app can access and when it accesses it and what it does with it with on-screen notification. Well, this week, as part of the new privacy features in iOS 14 that you can install as a beta if you wish, you can test it out right now, Apple introduced a transparency feature that will explicitly require users to opt in and out of allowing ad tracking within apps. Facebook's biggest fear is that many users will refuse ad personalization. What does that mean for Facebook? Well, it is their biggest fear. The only reason advertisers pay them big money is the value of Facebook data and how personal it is to each person. It allows advertisers to get their ads to the people who are most likely to purchase their products based on their likes, dislikes, lifestyles, meaning money spent efficiently with high return. But if you, the user, opt out of personalized advertising, you literally become a number. They don't know what you want, they don't know what you like, and what they should advertise to you. In turn, advertisers will pay less and less and ultimately not at all for what Facebook is selling. After all, the amount of iPhone users is significant. A very likely scenario is that users running iOS 14 either see no ads delivered through the audience network program or see ads that are less relevant. This could see Facebook lose around 50% of its revenue. Boo hoo. Let me know below if you would prefer completely unrelated ads to show on your feed or things that you might actually be interested in. I'd love to know your thoughts. Next up, Amazon's Jeff Bezos has broken a new record, his own in fact. He is now again the richest man alive, hitting a $200 billion valuation. Uh, he's about $90 billion above anybody else that's close to him, and that's it. That's it, he's just rich. I wonder how many rainforests he could save with that. In any case, next up, some news about the PlayStation 5. We are nearing its release date and hopefully pricing. Now I'm expecting it to be rather expensive, especially for us here in Australia, but it has been revealed that the next gen console will have next gen Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. Wi-Fi 6 and Bluetooth 5.1 will be included in the console, giving you a huge reason to invest in a Wi-Fi 6 router, but also means you probably won't need to connect your PlayStation with an Ethernet cable anymore because Wi-Fi 6 will be good enough and actually very good. As tested on a recent review of an ASUS laptop with Wi-Fi 6, we have finally reached the point where Wi-Fi and wired connections are on par for our current needs and even NBN speeds. And lastly, I thought I would share this story. We have seen plenty of companies make products related to COVID-19, but I've been waiting for this for a while and it could be the sign of another boring dystopia. LG is making masks, high quality LG branded masks. Masks is a built-in respiratory sensor that will detect how fast you breathe as well as its volume. Then it will adjust the fan speed to suit your breathing. LG says it'll expect people to wear this thing for hours on end and its 820 milliamp battery will run for up to eight hours on a single charge. The various systems inside are designed to ensure the breathing remains effortless despite wearing this thing on your face. In Western Australia, I don't have to wear a mask, but I certainly see myself using it when riding my bike near freeways. There's a lot of pollution coming along and you're just constantly breathing really heavily. Let me know if you would buy this. I might have to do a review of this product. After all, it's pretty techy. And so on that bombshell, I have to end this episode. Thank you very much for watching. Remember to like this video if you did and subscribe if you would like to see more. Thank you very much and bye.